back here. Uh, so today I'm going to speak about some work that I have done with my former postdoc, Zhou Lai Fu, who's now assistant professor at ITU, IT University of Copenhagen. So the work is about uh, how to analyze numerical software, and uh, we introduced this uh, uh, analysis uh, concept called mathematical execution. So first of all, is I probably don't want to motivate too much that floating point software is everywhere, they're important, bugs in them can cause to dis lead to disasters, and they're really hard to get right. Why they're hard to get right is because a floating point arithmetic is very different from like uh, you know semantics in real numbers that we're used to. And also there's a lot of linear functions and also transcendental functions like science, log, exponential, these kind of things. If you look at this piece of code here on the right, looks very simple, but if you are trying to say general input, try to cover all the branches, it's actually very tough. And all the pretty much existing known approaches will find this challenging. So now we have this very important problem, very hard. How should we try to make some progress? So here was our idea, and we call ME, mathematical execution. So the idea is that we're trying to formulate a analysis problem on numerical software. So here we have a program P, that's a numerical code, a property we want to check against this program. So the properties can be, you want to say, I want to find all the inputs, try to cover all the branches. I want to find all the boundary values so I can do some additional testing. Or I want to find detect runtime floating point exceptions, underflow, overflow, that kind of things. Or I want to solve floating point constraints. So now we have this problem we want to solve. And the idea is that we're trying to map this to a floating point program we call R. And then we can uh, solve this R using mathematical optimization. So the property we want to have is if we have an input that drives P to satisfy this property, if and only if the X minimizes this mathematical optimization problem R. So that's the goal we want to achieve. So we want to turn one problem to another. And uh, so I want to illustrate this concept, ME, using two instances. One is how to solve floating point constraints. The other one is how to perform coverage-based testing. For floating point constraints, let's look at this one here. So we have sine x equal to x, and we want x to be smaller or equal to this tiny constant. And uh, in terms of real numbers, this is clearly not solvable. But for floating point, this is solvable. Okay, so you also illustrate the difference between uh, uh, floating point semantics and real semantics. Okay, for real, because the only solution for x is sine x equal to x, x has to be zero. Okay. So here's the general procedure. Now we have a constraint pi, and then we want to find all the models of pi. What we do is we want to construct a floating point program R that measures the distance of how far x is to that set of models of x. And doing that, we simulate the constraint with a floating point program R. We require R of x at every point to be non-negative. And also, if Rx equal to zero, then we guarantee that x should satisfy the constraint. So that's what we want. And uh, so if we have R with this, two conditions, and then we can just try to use, minimize the R using mathematical op optimization techniques. And it's guaranteed that the constraint pi is certifiable at, if and only if that uh, you know, x star this one okay, minimizes the R equal to zero. So now the question is how do we construct this R to have these two uh, conditions? So I'll just illustrate this with a few constructs. It's a very simple reduction. And if we have, uh, imagine that our constraint is uh, in a conjunctive normal form, pi, and we want to construct this R from the formula, okay? So suppose we have two floating point variables, x is equal, x is equal to y, and then we just produce x minus y squared to measure how far they are. And if x is less than or equal to y, we use this C ternary construct. So if this condition holds, then it's zero, otherwise measure their distance. Okay, very simple. And then if it's a, con if it's a conjunction, it's just a sum. Disjunction times. So if you stare at this for a few minutes, a few seconds, you'll be convinced 
that this gives us this reduction. Of course, I leave some details out, right? but that's a high-level idea. So now we construct this program we want to minimize. And uh, so the idea is we want to, because the way we construct this R, we can apply local optimization to find the local minimum quickly, but we want to find the global optimum. So what we do is we want to use, Mark, we want to use a Mar, uh, Monte Carlo uh, Markov chain sampling, MCMC, to jump from one local optimum to another. So and then we hopefully to find a global optimum very quickly. And we use these tools as black boxes. And we do not, again, we do not analyze the constraints. We just want to ask you the R. Okay, we run the R. We run the program. We don't analyze the program. We run the program. So here's the illustration. And suppose we start from this point. We use local optimization to quickly go into this local minimum. And then we use MCMC sampling to jump to another point, And then hopefully we go to a global minimum. If that's zero, that means we have found a model for the constraint. So that's the idea. All right, I just want to restate some quickly. This is a very uh, straightforward theorem that we have this guarantee. And of course, there are some caveats. One is that, you know, you do, because we're running the program, we're still using floating point numbers. So there will be some inaccuracies coming out of that. And also, may, we may not be able to find the global optimal. Okay. And let me illustrate this just using the example constraints we have. We turn these uh, two clauses into this one here. And then we feed this to the mathematical optimization, will give us this, this one. So we find a model for this program. So very simple, okay? So the idea is very simple. We write there are some details in the uh, CAV paper we published in 2016. If you're interested, you can take a look or ask me. So our realization is called X set. And uh, so we evaluate this against two state of our solvers, math set and also these three and uh, use the SMT uh, floating point benchmarks, we get 100% consistent result as mass set, and then the performance is much, much better, okay? About three orders of magnitude faster than the other techniques, okay? So that's pretty much the general idea behind mathematical execution. That is, we turn the analysis of floating point code into a floating point program so we can run and try to optimize. All right, and then this idea can be generalized to various other things. Suppose we want to do a coverage-based testing. That is, we want to cover all the possible branches in the program, all the realizable ones, or we want to do boundary value analysis, detecting fluid point exceptions, or detecting past um, divergence. For example, maybe in the floating point one, somehow you take this control flow path with the same value in the, imagine we have a high precision arithmetic, they take a different control flow path. And the next example I want to show is how to do a coverage-based testing. Okay, and the goal, again, just to repeat, we want to find all inputs that try to cover all the possible branches of a program, okay? And this is tough, if you look at this piece code, it's really messy. You probably don't really want to look at this. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, from, I think, a Sun Math Library. And it's a very popular library. It has a lot of things. There's a pointers, there's like a type casting, bit operations, all these kind of things. You really don't want to analyze this. It's terrible. Okay, so, and uh, of course there are two standard techniques doing symbolic execution, okay? And we don't know how to solve floating point constraints. That's really tough. There's also the past explosion problem. And of course we can also do search based like testing and using AFL. Amer like AFL fuzzer, we can do that. But there is how do you define a fitness function? It's very tough. And also what kind of search strategies do we use? And uh, so the approach based on mathematics execution is we're not going to have these past issues, but you know, actually we'll have some of that. And we don't need to solve constraints because we run the program. And uh, so it's quite effective for floating point programs. Let me illustrate again, same idea is we want to, so here are the inputs that cover a new branch in the floating point code. And here we want to measure how far, given an x, how far is it to that, okay? And we're, again, we construct, given a program full, we construct another floating point program full r to achieve this. That is, again, on all possible input is non-negative, and then if it's zero, that means the input X covers a new branch in the program that we haven't covered. So that's the goal. And we repeatedly 
run this and try to cover another branch, cover another branch, okay? And then we terminate. All right, let me illustrate. So here's a high level. Suppose we have this program full, that's a given input floating point code. And uh, then we're going to instrument the code in a way like this. I'm not sure how, uh, yeah, I think you guys can see. Is we're going to insert this penalty function. We have this global variable r that measures this distance. And then at each branch point before that, we insert this penalty function. Okay, the penalty kind of like intuitively measures how far this x is coming from to cover an additional new branch. And there's a bunch of cases. So the, in the first case, if neither the true and false branch is covered, then we return zero because we know we're going to cover one of the branches. Okay? And if the true branch is saturated, is covered, and the other one is, uh, the false branch is saturated, but the true is not, then we return this one. That measures the distance. And there's another case that's a due. Otherwise, if we, if we kind of like covered both branches, we just return whatever, whatever R is. And we do similar things in this case, okay? So that's the high level idea. I mean, you don't need to pay as much attention to the details. Once we have that, is we construct this program, we call this a representing function, and then we have this full of R, we initialize R equal to zero, and then that's our instrument program, it will return the R. And our goal is to iteratively find the input that gives R equal to zero, because then we guarantee we cover a new branch and we repeat. All right, so let me illustrate. We have this little piece of code from the beginning, and uh, we want to cover all the four branches. Okay? And so we have this representation here, and then we start by looking at this penalty here. We have this penalty function, two branch points, and then we decide. So we have these two labels, L1 and L, uh, L0 and L1. In, in this case, because uh, it falls into the first case, that's you know, the true branch and false branch, none of them is covered. So in that case, we return R equal to zero. So that's easy. So any random input X will be able to help us to cover that. And imagine, and uh, so let's see. Oh, let me skip. So imagine the value that we'll pick is just random thing, 0.7. Now we run the program, and we're going to know that this branch is covered, this branch is covered and we repeat, yeah? Now two branches covered. We repeat, and then we say now, based on our full condition, now the penalty function becomes like this, okay? And this here is also updated. And then we try this again, and uh, so we solve, find the, try to find the minimum, and in this case, uh, let's see, and the value we're going to find is 5.1, Okay, and now with that, we cover this branch, yeah? Now, with this information, use our four conditions, we update the penalty function. This one, based on the case, falls into, because the true branch is covered, so it's going to be this one, the negation of the predicate and measure the distance. And this one, because both branches are covered, it falls into the last case, it's R. Okay, all right, and then we solve this again and then we're going to get another value. Now with this, all the four branches are covered, okay? So it's an iterative process. The process more complex compared to solving floating point constraints, yeah? So here's every time we generate the new penalty functions based on our four cases, and then and we run this math mathematical optimization. If we find a zero, that's going to cover a new branch, and re we repeat this process. That's how we do it. Okay, clear? All right. So, and then we build a true based on this. And uh, so front end is using like, a, you know, a clan infrastructure. And uh, so we use LVM. And then the back end is we use basin hopping for MCMC -MC sampling. And the experiments, kind of like the hairy floating point code I showed you from the Sun uh, floating point library. 
And uh, so that's a very popular one and use a, I mean, it has a lot of like uh, branches and hairy code. Okay, so for comparison, we'll compare this with, uh, that's really a baseline random testing, right? Because you say random testing is the most obvious thing to try. And the second one is AFL. And the third one is uh, one tool from University College London, UCL's Austin tool is search-based testing. And then also cover me, these two that uh, we implemented. And, uh, and as you can see, is we can cover very quickly 90% of the branches. And of course, you can see how come you guys cannot cover 100%. And the reason is because some branches, no matter how hard you try, are really not feasible. Okay? And uh, we cover with one-tenth of the time, covers 18% more of branches compared to AFL. And compared to Austin, we cover a lot more branches. Okay? And the speed up is really fast, several magnitude, uh, orders of magnitude, okay? So I think I went really fast. How fast? No okay. Can I have, uh, seven minutes? Oh, seven minutes, okay. Still not, not, not as, okay, all right. So I guess in my view, I mean, this mathematical execution idea is a very simple concept, but I think it's a very general concept. The hope is why this is termed ME, because we have I mean, random program execution, random testing, there's C, symbolic execution, SE, and also abstract interpretation, abstract execution. So I hope this one is going to offer some really interesting uh, you know, alternatives or complement these existing tools. Okay, so I guess with that, I'm uh, happy to answer some questions. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Who wants to start? Yep, Alex. Alex. <clears throat> Thanks, this is a really cool talk. Um, so, I wasn't totally sure I understood whether the mathematical optimization is done in the reals or in the floating points in the end. Floating point. Okay. That's why I mentioned one of the caveats, right, that is we also suffer from floating point inaccuracies, right? Of course, one thing to think about is maybe we can use higher, or, I mean, like, a, a, you know, higher precision arithmetic. Of course, the slowdown, we have to pay that price. It's a trade-off. Yeah, so you, I mean, so then you at least have guarantees that the solutions you find are real solutions, right? I mean, they're definitely floating points sure. by construction. That's right. Whereas otherwise, if you, if you did this in reals, you would have to also find the, that, the floating point solutions that, that are close. That's right. I think it's a pragmatic decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank Other questions? So would it be possible to do this in stages, like work with floating point numbers, and if you don't find solutions, try whether you find solutions within reals or the other way around? Uh, I think that's possible. That's something we haven't tried. might be worthwhile to, to try that. Yeah, especially in the cases where... Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, the benefit's not clear, but something interesting to explore. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Martin. Yeah, so I was wondering, like, so this optimization-based search, like, how does it combine with the other theories? If there is like mixed theory on the program, like floating point and then uh, uninterpreted functional arrays in the constraints, do you split it somehow? Or? Yeah, that's a tough question. Yeah. So this is particularly suited for floating point uh, programs and model integers because the integers, in a sense, is like more discrete. And here is the way that we're, you know, we kind of like can leverage local optimization, right? Because we can use the techniques from mathematical optimization to do that. If it's integers, it becomes tricky, right? But it's a very interesting thing to consider how to handle integers and floating point code in some interesting way. Yeah, yeah, good. That, that's a tough, uh, yeah. Any other questions? No, then, okay, let's uh, thank Shandong again. Okay, thank you, guys. <laughs>